Moving on to take a closer look, you know, there were some interesting things happening in the AMD's enterprise chip business. Since uh, 2014, uh, Forrest Narod has been building up this CPU vendor powerhouse. Um, and he has been made a major player in, in the CPU industry. He's broadened into network adapters with Xilinx and Pensando. He's taking um, traction in the, in the machine learning market as a next generation platform. So Narod sat down for an in-depth interview about what he's doing in the competition, especially with Intel, what's coming up with CXL, what's going on with Xilinx and Pensando and what the future holds for the company. So this is something that's been uh, top of mind at Gestalt IT for a long time. And I know you're seriously interested in this business. So what do you, what do you think's going on here, Stephen? Yeah, it was a really interesting interview. And um, Timothy Prickett Morgan from the Next Platform gets a lot of credit for bringing a lot of insight himself into the uh, whole proceeding. That being said, boy, uh, this is worth reading. It's worth spending some time on because it's hard to argue that AMD is not a key uh, competitor in basically every space that we cover here at Gestalt IT, whether it's uh, obvious things like uh, compute and cloud or maybe less obvious things like networking and security and storage. So let's talk about uh, what we see in this interview. Uh, first off, uh, one of the things that I'm reading through here is that uh, AMD kind of lucked out because Intel was so late with their Ice Lake and Sapphire Rapids parts. Essentially, AMD, uh, in, in they admit here, was constrained in terms of manufacturing. So no matter how many chips they wanted to make for the enterprise market and the cloud market, they really couldn't make all that the market would absorb. And that basically let Intel maintain a healthy uh, lead in those markets. That being said, uh, of course, AMD has been uh, actively trying to address that drought of uh, manufacturing capacity. And uh, if they do, when they do, we'll be in a very good position to compete with Intel. Of course, Sapphire Rapids has slipped and slipped, and that has uh, provided an opening here. As you read here, uh, the decision was made by Narod and the AMD team to delay their next generation Genoa um, uh, processor in order to include some support for CXL, which is a technology we've talked about quite a lot on the rundown, as well as on a recent checksum uh, editorial that I recorded. That ended up, uh, rather than hurting AMD, which is what they thought it would do because Sapphire Rapids would be on the market and Genoa would be late. Instead, um, it ends up helping AMD because, frankly, uh, Sapphire Rapids end up slip, slipping further and uh, AMD is going to deliver their support before Intel. What that means is that AMD is well positioned in the next generation space and has a seat at the table when talking about CXL. As you will see, uh, pretty soon here when we're uh, hosting the CXL forum at OCP Summit in a couple of weeks. What that means overall is that AMD on the CPU side is really neck and neck with Intel and is at this point only constrained by uh, manufacturing and architecture decisions that they're making. Now let's talk a little bit about those architecture decisions. Uh, AMD was early to the tile-based uh, chip uh, trend that we're seeing now. But Narad is a little bit more skeptical of UCIE, which is the uh, generic uh, standardized tile uh, interface for uh, chips that would allow different uh, components from different vendors to be combined on the same chips. He seems to be taking a much more pragmatic approach and talking about the technical needs of each individual block when putting together chips, whether it's uh, 3D memory or a combination of CERDAS or IO chips or accelerators on the same, um, on the same uh, processor module. And uh, Intel, on the other hand, seems to be much more committed to the open uh, UCIE standard. We'll see how that pays off for both companies, but I think that uh, you know, if Narada is correct, we could end up with another uh, generation of technical advancement from AMD using more proprietary chiplet interconnects instead of uh, relying on the standards like Intel. Now, maybe more important is the discussion of DPUs and network switches and so on that comes in here. 
Everybody knows, uh, hopefully, that AMD bought Xilinx, which was a leader in FPGAs and the big competitor to Intel in the FPGA market. And I think that a lot of people took a look at that and said, oh, well, AMD's doing a me too. They're just trying to keep up with Intel uh, in FPGAs. But just like Intel uh, got a lot more than FPGA technology, uh, AMD got a lot more uh, with Xilinx. In fact, Xilinx was one of the pioneers in DPUs as well as in digital signal processing and software. And I think a lot of people really didn't give uh, Xilinx much credit for that, though they deserve a lot more. Then AMD went out and bought Pensando, which was clearly the leader in the DPU space. Uh, the Pensado uh, P4-based uh, network processor is uh, sort of the gold standard in DPUs. And of course, Pensando had an amazing, amazing team uh, behind that, especially on the software side. Well, all of that is inside AMD now, which puts AMD in a very good position against companies like Broadcom, NVIDIA, Intel, and the DPU space as well. Uh, one of the things as well that's kind of amusing is uh, that uh, Prickett Morgan is trying to poke uh, Narad to talk about uh, AMD in the uh, chip uh, switching chip space. And uh, Steve, I know that you know a lot about uh, networking and security. Uh, maybe you can weigh in on that aspect of this whole conversation. Yeah, I found it very interesting that that he's making this wink and a nod towards the the networking side of the world. I mean, obviously, you know, DPUs a big part of what they are is is moving packets uh, efficiently on the on the chip, and that is, of course, at the core of what networking chips are going to do. But it is still a bit of a a move to go from uh, to move from an FPGA to a full ASIC model and full line rate on these things. So it's I think it's it's a move that's going to be, you know, a little bit of work for them, but but it's interesting that it's on their radar and it's something they're going to do. And I think they do have the people there that's going to be able to make that transition happen. It'll be interesting to see, you know, if they're able to do, deploy an, an FPGA based switching trip first and and get to a full um, large large scale uh, ASIC in that or or not. I mean, it's it's obviously a big difference in bandwidth when you're dealing with full scale switching with um you know anywhere from 48 or whatever ports to, from you know from the server side that you're dealing with at this point in the dpu stage but i, I think they've got a good shot at moving in here and taking a look i think overall at the takeaway message from this interview which again i do encourage you to read um i think that it seems like uh forest narod is going to be taking a much more practical and pragmatic approach whereas Intel is taking a much more, um, maybe forward-looking isn't the right way to say it, but uh, optimistic, uh, collaborative, standards-based approach to the future of the data center. In other words, uh, Intel seems to be betting big on manufacturing with partners, on building chiplet-based processors with partners, on encouraging UCIE and especially CXL-based systems and disaggregated systems with partners. Whereas AMD seems to be focused much more on what works today, what works in this generation, what works in the next generation, how can we deliver things that provide the best value on sort of a component by component or system by system basis to customers today, and keeping their options open on some of these open standards and partnerships in the future. That's not to say that uh, AMD is a poor partner, far from it. Uh, AMD is everywhere when it comes to uh, data center, cloud, uh, to these stacks and disaggregated systems, but uh, they are not uh, engineering their systems around standards for the purposes of being standards-based. They're engineering their systems around the best way to get the most value out of that silicon today and tomorrow, rather than trying to build, um, I guess, a, uh, a new open ecosystem of disaggregated systems. We'll see how that works uh, and how that plays out, but effectively, uh, AMD has been helped by so many uh, self-owns and, and, and self-goals from the Intel team uh, being late to the market with things like uh, their data center uh, CPUs and being a little bit slow to responding with next generation FPGAs that it really does open the door to AMD. But of course, throughout it all, there's one differentiator between the two companies that could end up being the key differentiator, and that is manufacturing. 
Uh, Pat Gelsinger is doubling down, tripling down. Uh, uh, I don't know what the word for 10x down is, but he's, he's making that bet on uh, packaging, both in terms of chip manufacturing as well as in terms of chip packaging. And what that means is that Intel is really saying that we're going to be the manufacturer of next generation chips, whether it's from Intel or not from Intel. AMD, on the other hand, is a customer. They need to pay companies like TSMC or, uh, dare I say, Intel to manufacture their products for them. And then that also dictates their roadmap, their chip availability, and their dominance of the entire industry. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out over time, because fundamentally, we could end up in a situation where AMD has perhaps the most promising uh, products, but is unable to deliver them in the volumes that Intel can simply because Intel owns the manufacturing side. Yeah, I, I think you've hit a couple of important points there. Um, you know, being a, a an active member in IEEE on, on two standards committee, I'm a big believer in standards. And I do think that standards as Intel is pursuing them are going to be a, an important part of the long-term um, expansion of growth and capabilities in the chip market. Because one person, one company cannot do it all. And it's these standards that are going to make the inter interconnection of these chiplets and functions, you know, give us the next huge breakthroughs. Um, but you also point out um, the, the difference in size and scope of these two companies. Intel has the ability to think long term and has the resources because they're soup to nuts. Uh, to be able to make that kind of bet and investment where AMD does need to be closer to the customer needs today and in the near term in order to in order to be successful. And one of the things I think AMD has been very good at is goosing Intel to, to maintain that connection with the customer as a result. Um, and Pat Gelsinger has had a lot to deal with in, in terms of that manufacturing too. They've had a lot of problems in rolling down the, the size of the nanometer technology over the last five years. And, and Pat's the real engineer CEO that can work directly with that uh, company side manufacturing and make those advancements happen, make them real, give them the resources they need and understand what they need and what they don't need and have the right kind of arguments between the CEO and the engineering team to make those things a reality. Well, thanks a lot for joining us uh, this week for the rundown, Steve. And I look forward to seeing you at a future field day event.